Cool, I can see some people are online. Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on the CSDMS uh, modeling tools and using them in the classroom. Um, today, what we're gonna do is we will go, I mean, this is basically the first webinar that, we're, that I'm doing uh, and CSDMS has just started these webinars um, this fall, um, but we're trying to walk people, give people some pointers to uh, the resources that we have and um, ask for feedback on development or um, how people are thinking to use tools or um, techniques that are being developed in our group here at the University of Colorado at Boulder. So my name is Irina Overeem, I'm the Deputy Director of CSDMS. Um, and I focused for a long time on the educational aspects of CSDMS uh, and so some of the um, labs and things that we'll discuss today um, are ones that I've used in classrooms and developed um, in the earlier years um, and we're moving ahead over the next couple of years to um, expand that repository and uh, build new functionality. So what we'll do today, um, I think this webinar is going to take 45 minutes or so. Um, I'll walk you through the web modeling tool um, and um, sort of like show how it sits in the general uh, CSDMS suite of tools. Um, and um, I think the um, slides and the uh, things that I'll show you are practical enough that people can sort of like get the um, the pointers to where these resources are um, and potentially use them themselves in uh, in teaching or um, for little projects with students. Um, I wanted to highlight that we have new options. We uh, switched over from our um, um, high performance computing system at CU that was called Beach that uh, CSDMS managed for a long time themselves uh, to a um, something that's called uh, condo cluster, cluster nodes on Blanca that are managed by Research Computing, who's been involved with CSDMS for a long time too. So like they're at CU Boulder too, and CSDMS has dedicated nodes on this system, um, but it does require um, setting up um, an account for access. Um, but we have new options for teaching, which uh, I think are exciting and make um, this whole sort of logistics part a little easier. Then the other thing that we'll do towards the end of the presentation is um, ideas that um, the integration facility here at CSDMS has uh, going on uh, on um, how do students uh, go from like um, working in a more graphical user interface and running the web modeling tool to potentially um, running uh, similar codes in Jupyter notebooks and sort of stepping out of a world where they set up experiments or fill in um, user interfaces to a world where they can like manipulate um, the code in a little bit more programmatic way. Um, then I'd like to ask people's feedback. I mean, you're all here participating and uh, um, so the last, I don't know, like five to 10 minutes or so, or maybe longer if it runs a little longer, uh, will be on uh, how we see these tools de develop into the next couple of years and um, solicit whether people are interested in using them, uh, how would they use them and what are, are your thoughts basically uh, on the, the web modeling tool and the Python modeling tool or the Python modeling tool or the notebook specifically. Um, so, so, yeah, this is kind of like sort of the timeline that I think will will we'll take. Uh, it may take me about twenty minutes or so to show you around uh, in the CSMS tools, and then um, a bit more chaotic 
uh, um, 10 or 20 minutes total of showing you around in the tools. But I do think that th that's going to be useful for people to get a bit of a feel of what a student would experience or what you would do yourself once you're interacting with these, uh, these tools and resources. And then some discussion. So CSDMS educational mission is really a, uh, one of the three pillars as we um, um, see CD CSDMS. Um, many of you are familiar with our meetings and sort of the community aspect of CSDMS where people come together who work on numerical models in the earth service processes um, and um, present their results and find new tools, etc. And that happens a lot through the annual meeting and, uh, and the working groups. And then um, our team works on like cyber infrastructure development and that like bleeds over or like is interacting. All of these pillars are interacting with each other. But there's also a pillar that's um, the educational pillar. And the mission of CSDMS for education is to develop easy to access and comprehensive cyber infrastructure to promote earth surface process modeling. And then specifically um, from the get-go, the educational uh, working group prioritized undergraduate students. Um, we found in collaboration with the National Center for Earth Dynamics, um, and CSDMS, uh, so every year in the Summer Institute, uh, CSDMS would come and work with NSAT and um, in those interactions, it was much more uh, focused on graduate students and postdocs and early career faculty. And I think many uh, faculty that have adopted these tools uh, sort of across the US um, for a class here or there, they use the tools with grad students as well. So that's a sort of a background. Um, to take away with you if you're thinking of uh, using CSDMS tools with students. So where do, do these tools sit? Well, um, the CSDMS modeling framework is um, pr provides services for developers to couple models and um, tap into a certain functionality um, uh, that enhances basically your own codes once you've got it compliant to like work with this uh, modeling framework. And to get models compliant, they need to be wrapped with a basic model interface. Um, and Mark um, is going to do a webinar on that in a, in a few weeks or in the next month. Um, so that's more on the technical and on the developing developer side. But then on top of the uh, CSDMS framework, there's sort of the tools that go with it. Um, and the web modeling tool is the tool that's been around for a while. It provides a graphical user interface and um, gives access to some of these components that have been wrapped with the basic model interface. Um, the tool, so the CSDMS tools uh, are installed on Blanca, the uh, high performance computing facility that I was talking about. Um, and so the web modeling tool like runs through this um, HPC system. Then a new, new tool that's always been under the hood, um, um, but that we're planning on exposing more in the next year is the Python modeling tool PyMT. So there's the WMT and there's the PyMT. So to give you uh, in a webinar, it's like a little, uh, I'm like in an empty room here and like <laughs> talking to like a list of participants um, to give you a bit more of like the faces of the people that work on these. Um, Mark Piper is the WMT developer and Eric Hutton is the PyMT and developer and, and both together work on the CSDMS framework. And then, uh, um, Lynn would be, Lynn McCready um, is our a program um, uh, or our account support and resources support person. So if you're interested in using some of these tools, like often you'll get to talk with her as a sort of a first entry way. And then Albert Kettner manages the web and data services. Um, and I would be your contact person for like educational repository or development of material or contributions of uh, material. And Greg Tucker is our director and heads us up. Um, so for models to show up in the modeling tool, they need to be 
have been developed as components. So that means there's like one more step from an original working model and numerical model to uh, being a component. And so that means that they have been, the code has been taken um, in such a way that uh, it's easy to run by single time steps or sting, uh, like distinct time periods. Um, and that there is an, a basic model interface around these model. And what that uh, boils down to for the purpose of today's talk is that uh, parameters uh, that components need and parameters that they generate are like spec specified with great precision. And that means that it creates a, a potential to couple with other process components that would need components or, or parameters out of um, one component would be the um, provided to other components. Um, and it means that we're standardizing uh, some of these inputs and outputs. Um, and that's done by standard names, which means that um, the, the variables that get passed basically uh, um, are precisely defined. And then another um, extra functionality that components have is they generate uh, net CDF output. So like all the output of models uh, will um, be in a sort of a similar format. Um, so how many components are in WMT? Um, there's a list that we try to um, maintain on the uh, website. It's not always 100% uh, coverage at the, because sometimes the component uh, gets changed or um, the interfaces gets changed a little bit, but there's a list of components that are served on the web and I put the pointer there for you to check out uh, what kind of models there are. Um, there's about 34 in total and they are, they are quite variable in uh, domains. So there's like a, a suite of hydrological components, there's coastal components, there is more stratigraphy and landscape evolution components. Um, in complexity, they vary quite a bit too. Like there's ones that are um, really like fairly small codes and then uh, like the frost number is one um, that is a, a tiny little uh, uh, functionality code for permafrost. And then there's models that uh, um, are uh, relatively large like child or ROMs um, that are also wrapped in this, uh, in this tool. And so the idea is that we're covering a whole bunch of the domains that the, the working groups in CSDMS and sort of the larger community covers. So what does the web modeling tool look like? It's uh, basically a web-based uh, uh, interface. Um, you would um, uh, type in this web address, uh, uh, csdmscolorado.edu. Um, slash WMT, and then you'd be presented with this um, um, screen or this this uh, first entry screen. And then the models are organized in projects. So we sort of group different models that are able to talk to each other and do exchange parameter in logical order. So the permafrost model will have like ones that are have to do with permafrost and climate, for example, or uh, hydrology is the ones that are that have to do with hydrology. But not necessarily, even if you could think of a connection between hydrology and permafrost, not necessarily have those parameters been exposed or um, are all these models on the same time scales or um, the same spatial scales? Um, and some remapping can be done, but uh, often then like science starts and uh, um, a bit more complex interactions happen. But so to prevent from people from uh, coupling things that really aren't um, compatible or scientifically compatible, this project structure um, helps with, with going into like places where like um, similar, scientifically similar components are grouped together. And so the coastlines uh, project, for example, would have a re incoming river, an evolution routine to like switch distributary channels around and then a wave component that um, interacts with the sediment that arrived, the bed load that arrives at the coast. Um, and, and so it's a logical combination of models and um, Sometimes papers have been written about those combinations. 
the analyst is the one that has uh, all the codes um, together. So like for those people who just want to see uh, what's in there and uh, um, that's a place to go. But it's also, it's called analyst because there's less guidance on what to connect together. Um, so what are the advantages of mod models being in the WMT? Uh, well, all these models that come from different developers uh, and different groups in the States or elsewhere um, are now like landed in, in sort of a similar environment. Um, they're exposed, like once you've learned how it works, you, you can like run fairly different models, um, but in a familiar a way of setting up parameters, etc. So, um, and then all under the hood, like some of these models have different codes. So, like Hydrotrend, um, oh, the ones that I've up here are mostly in C, I think. Um, but so there's Fortran codes, there's C codes. There, there are like a, a number of different uh, programming languages that you would not see when you're using the WMT and you don't have to have famili familiarity with them. The um, um, way that uh, I think people have the easiest way of like teaching with the um, WMT is to use the modeling labs as they're written in the educational repository of CSTMS. So I put this um, web address here down here to show you uh, where they are. Um, they're a set of um, different domain topics um, and any of them uh, um, um, go in with questions that have more to do with like the topical um, question than that they're like tied to a specific model. And, and so, the, the topic would be sediment supply to the global ocean and we're asking questions about like how rivers change with climate. Um, but in a way, um, even if we're using the hydrogen model, we might not um, care so much that this is the hydrogen model uh, when we're doing this with students. So we're more interested in the concepts of like how does sediment supply change. Um, on the other hand, a person who knows that they want to use HydroTrend for some question, the research question that they have, this may be a great way of like getting to know the model a little bit and see at least the very basic functionality of it. And so then you would be interested in the specific model. So these labs, like when you when you click on the on the connect the, the links, these labs have a list that um, have the topical learning objectives. They usually have a presentation on the model linked to it, a PowerPoint that has the basic principles of the model, and then they include practical instructions for simulations, uh, some guidance on useful and working experiments, uh, and questions to. The, the user or the person who run, who does the lab to inquire the model output. Um, I, I think um, I'll skip out and show you one of these. So share my screen. Um, okay. Hmm. Are you seeing the um, web page that I pulled up? That's the link to this model. No, I think it's working. Y yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the people here like showed up and said, yes, um, I think I have you muted that. Um, so, so this would be one example of um, how one of these mo um, online models is set up. Um, so this is the river sediment supply modeling um, lab. Um, there'd be a presentation link to it that you can download if you're 
um, wanting to know a little bit more in depth about the model. And then it has um, instructions and some screenshots to like guide you through like setting up an experiment like this. And so often there's some kind of a base case that comes out of a paper or uh, out of a, a very simple reasoning um, that is the first experiment that people would run. Um, you like ask for different output files and run the experiment in WMT. And then there's related questions that guide people through uh, using these models and uh, thinking about what kind of output are they looking at and thinking about like what does the model tell me about the experiments that I just set up and ran. Um, so like this example here has like a uh, um, couple of like future scenarios of how this small river system, the Waiapoa that had been published on uh, would change with changing um, climate conditions, for example, precipitation or temperatures, etc. Um, or the other experiment here that we're doing is um, uh, hydrogen has an anthropogenic uh, component to it. And so we were looking at like, hey, how would things change if we're changing the anthropogenic factor and what, what, for, what kind of implications does that have on um, erosion? And then often these things are from experiments that have been done and then there's um, um, references to papers uh, that go with that if people want to read up on these. Okay, let me... Um, go back to my power, sharing my PowerPoint. Um, hopefully that will work. Here we go. So um, WMT generates NetCDF files and it will like point to a window that um, um, shows the file as a little package and you can download the little package that has a complete set of the input files that you generated, the settings, um, and then the output files that the model generated. Um, but we don't have an um, developed uh, visualization uh, tools for this and that was a conscious decision because there are quite a bit of like visualization tools for NetCDF files and so one of the easy ones that um, I've been advocating for if you're running uh, things in a teaching situation or in a lab is to download this tool that's developed by NASA that's called Panoply um, that deals with NetCDF files quite easily. So um, you basically open the files that you would have gotten out of the, the run that you just did in a WMT and then create these plots with them uh, by just clicking, um, clicking around in the Panoply tool. But it's a separate little package that, uh, that people download and uh, it's fairly small. It, and it runs under Windows and Mac and Linux. So. Um, so it's been compatible in the labs that I've taught with many students and sort of a quick and fairly intuitive way of doing that. And then the labs do have instructions that go with that too. So as an example, um, so I was just um, walking you through this um, educational lab that was about HydroTrend, um, which is a model that simulates a river fluxes to the ocean based on climate um, scenarios and uh, um, basin characteristics. And so typical output that you would get out of that is daily discharges over um, a period of time that you indicated. So like these are runs for 100 years. And so um, sort of the, the primary parameters that the model generates are discharge, daily discharges, and then these are daily sediment, um, sediment loads over time and so students would inquire as like, what is the the what does it look like um, are there trends if we have a climate trend etc um, and then here i compare two different runs so i compare um, a case the case that we were just looking at which is like sort of the default case for the situation now and then um, it's a little less visible but in um, yellow is a case where we do a wettening over the century, which is uh, uh, relevant for um, 
New Zealand where they expect weather climate over time and then look at like what would the discharge of this river system do and you can kind of see that it's like starts uh, ramping up over the 100 years. So as I said, um, WMT runs on the, um, the Blanca system, so the HPCC. And to run uh, simulations with the WMT, if, if you're an instructor uh, or you want to do like a whole bunch of experiments, etc., cetera, then uh, you will need to set up an account. Um, and we have um, instructions for this. Um, on our website um, and I'm, I've listed the, the um, entry points for that um, but do keep in mind that this will take a little while like it takes a few days because there's really an, uh, a sort of certification or like a process in which um, the CU like establishes credentials for you um, so yeah um, it, WMT is not as useful if you're planning for the lab and you need to do it the next morning with students. So it really does require a little bit of uh, prep. Um, Lynn is the person who um, keeps track of these accounts and communicates with research computing to, to help set them up. And then in that process, you'll get good instructions uh, that come with like, oh, your account is ready and here's how you get into it or here's how you do the certification or here's how you um, log into it. And so we're excited that since this like five to seven days thing happens and um, that is a lot of work for students to like a, a set this up and then it's work for on the side of like uh, establishing these cr credentials if it's just for a class that runs like one day or uh, an, a few hours then it's almost not worth to do, go through that whole procedure and so we've worked with research computing and um, the solution to this is that uh, if you're just instructing a class and you know that it is a given time you can use these teaching logins that they can supply you with so like there's still a little bit of preparation because you need to talk to us or talk to research computing to set this up but then they'll give you a list and not every single student or every single participant in a clinic needs to um, <coughs> needs to have these credentials established and it's just the instructor that that gets that list and gets all the anonymous um, accounts and passwords so I think that removes a big hurdle because it was always a lot of work to um, do with even with a class of like 30 students or so uh, we would start three weeks ahead of time and make sure that everybody would like follow these instructions and do that and that is kind of taken away from this as an instructor or as a like more advanced user um, you can't get away this way but um, for teaching it's going to be a, a useful uh, workaround Cool, so um, I am gonna try to show you what this looks like in the WMT. Um, are there questions so far or are there people who wanna um, ask a question already? I'll try to unmute you. So are there any questions or shall I just continue on? Um, okay, no, no pressing questions so far. Okay. Good. So I'll skip out of the PowerPoint and show you um, in uh, on the website like what um, a um, active do I have a terminal open um, Okay, this is gonna take a second. So 
So what I just did, and you should be able to see, is um, I typed in uh, HTTPS CSDMS code call slash WMT. And so that lands you on the um, CSDMS web modeling tool page. And then you would select a project. Um, I've recently been working with uh, the PERMA model team on the permafrost model. So that's the one that I'll show you today. Um, but there's other projects. Um, but I just wanted to give you an impression of what it looks like. So there's a login separately for WMT. Um, and then that brings you into this specific project and the logins are unique to like different projects. And you can like sort of find out these drivers, which are the models that are there and see like in this project, what is organized together here. And so in the case of the permafrost model, we have two versions of a frost number model and we have two versions of a, a Kudryatsev model and they're both uh, have to do with um, calculating uh, permafrost conditions from um, climatic data and from a layered model of vegetation and snow in case of the Q model. And then the little tags for uh, geo mean that these are like plan, plan view, map view models versus the ones that are just frost number model are 1D uh, column models or just like one point models. Um, and that is, is not necessarily by design of the WMT, that's by design of this group of developers who said like we split these up this way and we were like componentizing them this way. So um, something like that comes out of the developer group and then it gets wrapped with a BMI um, in the models and exposed through WMT. So just to show you when you would go into one of these, so like here I'm exposing the Q model, it will like show you a list of parameters, right? You can set the, the runtime, um, when do you want to start the simulation in the year 2000 is what we're doing. We're doing annual time steps. This is an, a model that runs over an annual um, sinusoidal cycle of climate. Um, it asks you like how many outputs do you want? So if you want the annual output, you want to match those up. Um, uh, what, this is one, and this is 15. Um, and then you can manipulate like specific parameters that are, that are um, typical for this model. So in this case, it's air temperature or snow depth or uh, vegetation. Um, and you would ask for different outputs and get an CDF file of these outputs. Um, and then you could potentially run this model. In this case, um, the climate model uh, comes from an can come from a different component. And so here there's two components that are data components um, that are couplable to this model. And so in that case, you would get your um, input data from either CMIP, which is a climate reanalysis data set, uh, um, um, future model intercomparison data set, um, and it runs um, into the, this full century up to 2100, or you can go with like a climate reanalysis data set. And so if you do one of these couplings, then the other component has its own parameters as well. So you would look at show parameters and then um, have like, again, options of what you would wanna do um, with that component. Um, to learn something about the models or know something about the models, there's uh, some information uh, uh, attached with each of these models and a little like write-up. And often there's a, a link to the actual repository at CHDMS uh, that has more references and more information there. So to prevent um, the WMT from being a black box. Um, so you would run this model. I'm gonna skip this step because uh, um, it's gonna, it's not gonna take super long, but it's the uh, initialization and et cetera uh, takes a little bit of time. Um, and so basically um, once you run a model, it will bring you to um, a window that has um, outputs and you can download outputs 
like with with this little cloud um, to your local machine. So like I just um, have like a CMIP5 uh, run that I download the tarball and I like untar that and then I can visualize it in Panoply. Good. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the PowerPoint because I just wanted to give you an impression of like what the um, environment looks like in the um, So I realized that that uh, those demonstrations make it a bit more chaotic in the um, in the Zoom and the sort of the webinar uh, format, but on the other hand, um, it seems much more clear to people what the uh, functionality is and what you can do in these models once they've seen the um, the environment uh, in 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 real or like live. Then when I'm just putting up like screenshots of it. Um, but the basic things uh, that we were just looking at was like changing parameters and then this um, um, grabbing down or grabbing things from downloading from a, a model output once it's run. Um, I'll skip through these. these. These are a bit more explanation of the of the model itself and what's under the hood. Um, but so, what can you do with such medium complexity models or fairly uh, not super super difficult models? Well, you can do actually small predictions if you have data sets um, associated with it, which is what we're doing with those data components. Or if you have your own data sets, you can upload uh, small text files, for example, of time series of um, climate data. And and then calculate active layer thickness. And so in, in this example, this was a discussion that I had with a colleague of the USGS and they were uh, trying to defend to, um, the, I don't know, like a, an, an, a supervisor in the USGS that it's important to maintain these stations and measure the snow thicknesses over uh, permafrost. Um, and they wanted to quickly show like how different would it be if we didn't have the snow data locally? Um, how different would the active layer thickness um, measurements be? And so um, that would be like a very quick run that you could do with a model like this. Um, this idea of bringing in data um, as a as a components into the WMT is new, and it's something that's going to uh, move forward in the next uh, in the next um, years. And uh, in the permafrost model, uh, that gets pioneered a little bit. Um, and yeah, we like to hear from people uh, how useful it is to have like links to reanalysis data or climate output, future climate output, and also like bring those components. The idea is that they then are available for other domains too, once they're wrapped. Um, but it also takes time to do and um, is a little specific. Um, but we found in the in the, in this specific permafrost project that it's been useful because you can like benchmark uh, data against in situ data better if you um, upload the in situ data or you can do a model to data comparisons. Where here we're looking at like active layer thicknesses modeled in like bold lines and then um, 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 from station data in the in the um, dotted lines. And so um, typical uh, data sets that were ingested in that model and I think could be useful also for like landscape evolution models or uh, hydrological models are um, the climate reanalysis data. Um, and they're, they're huge, they, they cover large time spans and um, for this specific project we cut out um, a, a domain because it's specific to the Arctic. Um, but then um, once those, uh, data sets are components they are potentially like available to other other projects and other models too if they need air temperature or precipitation good so an example of visualization of that in the panoply tool it looks like this good 
Um, so I think I've given you an impression of the uh, WMT and its strengths and weaknesses while we're going through this. So um, I'm, I put down the ones that I think are strengths and weaknesses and I'd like to like ask for feedback in the end. So in five minutes or so, once I've showed you the alternative as well. So I think uh, strengths are that it's easy to use and that there's no coding required. The fact that it's a, a similar interface for a large variety of very different models. Um, I've seen students like think through like how do I set something up? What do I do like as a sensitivity test or what do I do as a as a new hypothesis? And so it helps people thinking about modeling in a in a way and it familiarizes new users with complicated models or the basics of complicated models. But there's also drawbacks and they're mostly in uh, flexibility. So there's not so much flexibility to do experiments of your own design, except for tinkering with the parameters that are exposed. Another thing is CSUMS has a, um, in their educational mission, a mission of bringing students up to speed in coding and teaching them basic coding uh, practices. And that does not get done so much in the WMT. Uh, um, and then uh, with the panoply software that I've been uh, using with students, uh, um, you cannot do quantitative analysis. You just look at figures and do visual comparisons. And so one new alternative that we have is to bring these same models through the PyMT into Jupyter notebooks. Um, and to give you a quick sneak peek of that, um, is this is that same, um, run that we just went through um, and it's, it's called like introduction to permafrost Pro project and um, it exposes a bit more in the python notebook what gets done under the hood so like there's a configure file that gets run you need to initialize the model you would update the model um, and um, to be annoying i'll skip out one more time and share my screen um, that has this notebook Um. Oh, this is the hydrogent notebook and this is the um, model that we're just looking at. And so So um, in the Python notebook, you would have a little bit more insight in uh, what is going on under the hood with running a model. Um, you would get a little bit more idea of what kind of variables are coming out of these models um, and uh, see like how small loops are done, for example, over time or, um, and so, so the experiments are mirrored compared to the WMT experiments. Um, so we're just changing small parameters. Like here, we're changing the volumetric water content from 20% to 60%, for example. And then you would run these like by using them in a notebook environment. And so fairly simple, um, you'd go through and just run these. And so a student could like um, just only run these models um, by clicking the, um, clicking the, the different code boxes in the, uh, in the notebook, um, but get to. And then the same questions that we had before are listed just as text questions in this case. And so here we're like changing snow depths. Um, and so then one of the things that it allows is you can, um, more easily uh, change parameters um, or, or you can as easily change parameters. That is no difference. You can maybe a little bit more easily manipulate data sets and like put in your own data set. So like in this case, I like pull a data set from GitHub that is pre-made for this experiment, but you could as easily in your own directory have a CSV file that you set up beforehand and then uh, run the same model with that CSV file. Um, and then another thing that I think is a strength is um, students like 
to like manipulate the plots more. And so if they have if they have some familiarity with matplotlib or with Python in general, they can like manipulate the plots so that um, they um, get some experience with coding. And so like here is one example of one of those boxes where people see that, okay, this is actually a loop over time as opposed to like, I'm just running this over time. Um, good. Uh, so that's that's just a sneak peek into um, what what we've been doing, um, and these are not the, these are by no means finished. I think it will take uh, another like maybe a few months. Uh, um, Eric is planning to release the Pi model modeling to um, by early um, winter of two thousand nineteen, um, and. Um, we're striving to have these notebooks go with them then. Um, you would still, uh, it would still require some setup with students again too, in the sense that um, they would need to install something like Kanaconda or like a Python programming environment um, and then um, um, download these notebooks or git clone these notebooks uh, depending on how they're served like for now they're on the G uh, csdms github repository but we um, we are envisioning to link between the wmt like where now the wmt labs are and then also have pymt labs there or Py python notebooks there so um, strength of weakness and weaknesses of these notebooks and i think the notebooks address some of the um the weaknesses of the WMT in the sense that they do give a little bit more flexibility uh, and perhaps some more insight in programming and teaches students first steps towards coding. Um, but then um, um, it also requires a, a, a uh, a bit more programming savvy student where um, either they need some familiarity with Python to like do um, use these notebooks to their full potential um, and this setup um, is not really suitable for bigger or more complicated models that would run um, that would take more run space because they would run locally on the machines of students so good I wanted to that, that's sort of my last uh, um, slide, I wanted to open it up uh, for discussions um, and ask people um, whether they um, think this is going to be useful um, and whether they would be able to use these models, etc. So I think if you, I have unmute, unmuted you all and you can unmute, un, unmute yourselves if you want to like comment to these. Irina, do you foresee uh, limitations with resources if a bunch of students or separate classes are attempting to work on this at the same time? Um, so far, not so much. Um, one of the things that I usually do is have like people like in groups of two. Um, and But basically what resource computing has done is they set aside some space if they know that you have a class um so so then there's not so much of an issue and is there a a process in place if members of the csdms community want to contribute labs to the repository i mean um mostly it is like please email us and uh, we'd be really psyched to <laughs> to have that um and um but it's it's almost it's rare enough that uh, um, it's usually a one-to-one, one -to -one, like some interaction with the facility. So like on our educational website, there is a like contributed lab um, tab, but it basically says like email Irina or email csdms.colorado.edu. And often um, our service or like our thank you for like contributing these labs is that we'll like go through them and run them on our side and see whether we can run them too. And so that gives like a tiny little bit more robustness right. to the labs. But yes, we very much welcome them. 
Great. Yeah. Yeah. And members have done that too. You know, these are not um, like Courtney Harris and Julia Moriarty did, are the main people who did the ROMS labs. And then um, Rebecca Lozon just contributed a lab over the summer that she'd been working on. Uh, so, so yes. <coughs> Are you thinking uh, um, Python notebooks? Uh, correct. Yeah, I, I haven't too much experience with PyMT, though. Um, I'm sorry, uh, WMT. Um, right. But yeah, that's what I've I've used more so. Okay. Well, very cool. <laughs> We'd love it. Um, so, so another question that I had is, uh, um, we've sort of artificially uh, um, divvied up our thinking about uh, in this, in like undergraduates and graduate students and think that um, um, one, students are thinking more programmatically or they want to do like their own stuff. They're usually like either their upper division or they are graduate students. But if you want to give students a little bit of exposure with running a model and thinking about a model, then perhaps like a graphical user interface is what you want to go with. And we'd like feedback on that because, you know, like um, what are the experience with uh, that other people have with this or um, trying to find out what people, how people feel about running notebooks with um, like, I don't know, undergrad level students. And here some people are doing stuff, but not so much. <laughs> so not so much thoughts about uh, undergraduates or graduate students. Uh, another option that we uh, have thought about is to survey the community on this and um, try to find out in that way um, what what their experiences are with students. I've um, asked people at meetings and uh, and even from people who are really big fans of like bringing coding to students. Uh, um, we've had had uh, notes where people said like, no, 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 for when it's really an undergrad class, then the graphical user interface is really still gonna be very useful for, for teaching as well. And that's maybe something that the educational working group would uh, keep taking up too. Cool. Um, Are there other ideas or things that I've missed uh, that you would like to contribute today or that are useful for like setting a bit of direction uh, to these, these um, developments for like the next half year or so that are useful? Good. Well, well, we stayed within the hour nicely. Um, thank you for participating and thank you for like listening and like thinking about ideas of how to use CSDMS tools in the, in the classroom. Um, these are, um, this is a process that's in flux and uh, moves forward. And uh, yeah, we're sure that we'll have more um, over the next semester or so. And so keep an eye, keep your eyes peeled on the um, developments that are going to happen in the repository, um, and see those notebooks start popping up over time. And feel free to email us. Uh, um, like we're here, and um, we are excited if people use the tools and uh, and want to contribute to the tools. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. It's good seeing you online. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, everybody.